Social identity is very important also. Social identity explains how people feel about themselves as it relates to the group within, within which they believe they belong. And by the way, this is in psychology and sociology, the histories, the, the X's and the O's, sometimes the, they, you know, we, we experience it here and they put the minorities against each other a lot of times. And um, uh, the group theory comes like, hey, I belong to a group and I have to protect my group. And when I protect my group, I, because I belong to this group, I need to protect it. So the, one of the researchers, they postulate that the groups which people belongs to were an important source of pride and self-esteem. We all know that from our community as we all pride, proud members of our community. Whether we really, um, we have different values, we value different things in the community, but we're still very proud members of a community. And that's why, because we are members of this group. So in order to increase one's self-image, sometimes they, enhan um, uh, they enhance the status of their group and they discriminate against other groups, you know. Uh, by discriminating other, against other groups, this is they affirm the value of their own group as known by the X's versus the O's. There is also uh, a mental um, the, the cognitive dis dissonance. Uh, this is a theory that says about the individual. What I'm trying to establish here that all these theories, and there are so many, that hey, they determine the individual. Well, the individual is a child, or the individual is, is adult, they all apply. They all apply. So, where we, where we go from here? In, in my experience, I have, um, I have been a member of the community for, um, since I really came to, uh, to uh, America, I reside in Dearborn first, and it's by chance, all by chance. And I was supposed to go to Lido, but I ended up in, uh, in, in Dirwan here from the first day. And I stayed. And pretty much I, I have moved several times, three, four times, but I came back to Dirwan. Or I came back to Dirwan, Dirwan, Dirwan Heights. It seems like I'm, I'm attached to this community. And, I'm, and I've been a member of this community since then. When I was a student, I, uh, we, we had, several students groups, um, Arab Student Association at one time, Lebanese Student Association, uh, I'm sorry, Lebanese Student Union. Then out of the university, I found uh, Access and I became member of Access. I, I worked with Access very, very much. As a matter of fact, I was a member of the people who really brought this, this, uh, uh, museum. Uh, this museum, this building, and uh, worked hard. I was at Ford at the time and worked hard to really help the rest of the community in raising for that. So I was a community member. At the same time, I was lucky enough to marry someone who um, uh, sees the, see life and sees society similar to what I do. So we had a lot of similarity in that matter. And I found out that we had almost like uh, one thing common in common in ourselves. Um, she was very loved by her family and I was very loved by my family. And I'm not talking about mom and dad only. The reason why I mentioned that, I'll tell you in a second. So I found out that I, my father and mother loved me very much. I was my mother's helper since I was five years old. And I was my father's, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? The, the best child or whatever in, in the house. And uh, uh, it doesn't mean that the father, I don't know, I am, I'm a father of four. I don't mean that I love one versus the other, I love them all the same way. But a lot of times that due to certain character that you know you prefer, you not prefer, but you just uh, give someone the benefit of the doubt more. And I found out that she is also the same way, so we did. And the bottom line for that is our relationship got better and better for that family is because of our background, because of the acceptance of the love, the acceptance that we've had of our family. So we sat down one time and we talked about that and we, we kind of got you know, to know that yes, this is very important. So we were lucky and we had kids and the first thing we did is um, we said, you know, um, what are we gonna do? You know, now we are educated. My mom and dad didn't know any, uh, we're not educated. 
They're wise in their own way, but they were not educated. So we are here, the college graduates, and what, what are we going to do about our kids? You know, how we're going to treat them? Are we going to raise them different? Then I said, start talking, start learning more. I found out that the most important thing in raising a child is the self-esteem, is her or her self-esteem. And then one day, uh, and I bought a book on that, and I read it all, and I start reflecting. That's the importance of that. But the, the other thing, as they say in there, is what builds the self-esteem is the love for that child. Is the love that child that child uh, sees from the uh, from the beginning. And I felt the same way that yes, you know, I can relate to that. And so my my uh, my my wife also relate to that. So she came one day and she uh, had a. Uh, uh, a paper in her hand, if, and it says on it like 14 different principles if a child lived with, live, lives with, and it's from a book. If a child lives with criticism, he learns to condemn. If a child lives with hostility, he learns to fight. If a child lives with fear, he learns to be apprehensive. If a child lives with jealousy, he learns to feel guilty. If a child lives with tolerance, he learns to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, he learns to be confident. If a child lives with, with praise, he learns to be appreciative. If a child lives with acceptance, he learns to love. If a child lives with approval, he learns to like himself. If a child lives with recognition, he learns that it's good to have a goal. If a child lives with honesty, he learns that truth, what truth is. If a child lives with fairness, he learns justice. If a child lives with security, he learns to trust in himself and others. If a child lives with friendliness, he learns the world is a nice place in which to live. I was ecstatic when I saw that. I said, you know what? This is, let's make them our principles and try to raise our kids within these principles. And it worked. In my book, it works. You know, We have a very good family, we have a strong family. I uh, tried hard, you know, actually there is a lot of challenges in life. The challenge between, between uh, raising a family, work, and um, uh, making sure that you're still active in the community. We really use those as a principle. Now we got kids who, we got uh, my, uh, my kids were very uh, involved from the get-go. They were involved in the school, first of all. They were involved in their groups. Uh, my backyard was was the uh, the union of the neighborhood. My front yard was the uh, the court, the basketball court of the neighborhood. So I know. Um, do I have a few minutes more? Yes, and we need to have some questions and answers. Okay, all right. So what I did, what I did uh, in that, um, what I'm what I'm saying is, I raised my kids so there would be no gap. There would be no generational gap between us. I consider myself a, a soldier of, of uh, social justice, and um, um, I raised them in a way that I want them to be um, to have um, open mind. To uh, op everyone can be your friend, regardless of race, national origin, religion, uh, or others. Um, as a matter of fact, I raised them, I don't know if you'd be surprised, I raised them with no religion whatsoever. Even though I grew up in a Muslim uh, uh, family, in a very much Muslim family, and they're all very faithful. My mom and dad and everybody, sisters, everybody. But I raised my kids with no affiliation. So at one time there in the school, the oldest daughter came in and said, I want to I wanna fast. I said, I want you to write me a, uh, an essay why you want to fast. I don't want you to fast for your friends. If you want to fast to belong, don't do it. It's the wrong reason. If you want to fast to be faithful, I welcome you. If you really find God, I welcome you. If you want to find religion, I welcome you. I have no issue whatsoever. I want you guys to have open mind. And this is how we started the relationship. And so we grew, they grew to the point where they became my friends, they became our friends, I should say, and um, we really have an enjoyment with them. As far as the gap, 
I don't know if there is a gap. Yes, there are certain things that they still talk to me about, and that's very important. They still talk to me about. It doesn't matter what the subject is. And this is the thing that I established with them, that I'm your, I'm your last line of defense because I'm your father, I'm your father and mother. We are your last line of defense. Come to us for any issues. Come to me for any issues, personal, psychological, whatever it is, because we are here to help you. You're not going to find anyone on earth to love you more. You're not going to find anyone on earth to help you more. And at the same time, I couldn't say that if I did not build it from the ground up. So my, my story and my, um, you know, my definition to the generational gap is, the last statement, <clears throat> is um, the generation gap is a constantly moving target. It can only be bridged by love and acceptance. Well, the parents have their time impacting the society at large, but the most important impact that a parent has is on his or her own children. Many people have been heroes in the society, and when it comes to their kids, they did not know to express their feelings to them. My friend, that's all I have. I hope I did the subject. Do you have time for questions? What's your name? Uh, Rafiq. Rafiq? Yeah. So you were talking about self-actualization. What would, uh, what would drive someone to want to become self-actualized? 